Well, in terms of the short-term health risks, uh, the Japanese government did the right thing in moving the population away because the, the most dangerous bit about it, if you like, was the iodine, which has a very short half-life. So within eight, within eight days, half of the iodine release will have decayed. And within three months, it's all gone from the environment. So in terms of the short-term health risks, it was really those that we associate with iodine that were, were foremost in everybody's mind. The longer-term health risks, well, there really aren't any. Um, because of the, the, the moves that were made by the, the government, um, you reduce the risk very markedly. Uh, and in fact, the, the doses that they actually measured in the thyroid glands of young children was about one hundredth of those from Chernobyl. So they did exactly the right thing in minimising those risks. Longer term, people worry about cesium because it's a longer lived isotope in the environment. But there's plenty of evidence from Chernobyl and elsewhere that, that exposure to cesium, because it doesn't concentrate anywhere in the body and because of its long physical half-life, it doesn't give a large dose of radiation. And in fact, the people around the areas uh, evacuated from, from Chernobyl, when they went back to live there, over about 25 years got the same as about a CT scan's worth of radiation, but over a 25-year period. Whereas if we go into, op uh, into hospital, we'll have a CT scan that gives us a dose of about 10 millisieverts in a matter of seconds. So you can see that low dose, protracted exposure, there's very little health risk at all. Well, in terms of the actual risks, there aren't any that anybody needs to be worried about. If people are concerned about exposure to radiation, it's very simple to carry a personal dosimeter around with you. And there are plenty of things that you can look up on the internet that will give you an idea of where that dose fits into other things. So, for example, coming here, I would have got a dose of 0 0.07 millisieverts on the flight. Uh, and I actually went round Fukushima Daiichi on Wednesday and the dose that I had going around the site, so very close to where the reactors are, it was 0 0.01 and probably lower, but that's the lowest it could actually read. So I got more of a dose flying here and we'll get a dose tomorrow when I fly home than I would have done from being in Fukushima. I think the problem with radiation is my generation certainly were brought up to be very fearful of radiation because we had the Cold War and we were told the atomic bombs were going to finish all life on the planet and we believe most of that. Um, and you can't smell it and you can't see it and you can't hear it. So it's something that you have no sensual way of knowing it's around you. But actually there's a good reason for that because we are surrounded by radiation that the Earth is naturally radioactive. The other reason that it's, it's really difficult is, is we can measure it so accurately. I mean, if you think of a chemical, if, if there's always a, an, a limit below which we can't actually detect that chemical in terms of parts per million. With radiation, we can t detect it down to the nth degree. So we think if we can detect something, it must be doing us harm. But there's another way to look at this. If you think about sunlight, now, we all know there's a risk of melanoma, which is a skin cancer, from being exposed to the radiation from the sun by going out in the sun. So if you go out, particularly if you're Australian, and you go out and you sit in the sun, the sun's very strong. So a long time exposure, a high intensity, and your skin goes red and it burns. Now, we know that's a consequence of being in the sun, but we don't stop people being exposed to the sun. We advise them how to minimize their risk, and it's up to them whether they listen to us or not. So we don't set any safe limits for the minimum exposure or to sunlight that you can have. But for radiation, we seem to want to set those, those limits. Whereas actually, we have plenty of evidence to suggest that being exposed to the sort of doses that come out of nuclear power plant accidents is far less dangerous than going and sitting on a beach in Australia in terms of health risk. But we seem to have a real problem, a real schizophrenic idea about radiation. It's okay to go and sit in a spa and be exposed to radiation. It's okay to be exposed to radiation providing a doctor gives it to you. But it's not okay if it comes from something somewhere else that's man-made. Your body doesn't care where that radiation comes from. It treats it as just the same. So we, we have a peculiar relationship with it, which is obviously buried deep in our psyche. But we, we need to grapple with it and, and get a better understanding of it. I think one of the major problems with the communication post Fukushima was the mixed messages that were coming. 
um, from, the, from the world's press. The Japanese press were actually quite moderate in the way they reported any possible health risks. The international press had a field day and the language that was used and, and humans react to language very strongly. So if you pick your words, you can really spike terror into people. So, you know, catastrophe, apocalypse, things like this. People know those are words you need to be frightened of. So I, the one thing I would say is we must be much more measured in our reporting and think what the consequences of what you're reporting are. If you are trying to frighten somebody, then, you know, fine. But if you're trying to be a good journalist and put the facts over, there is no need to be sensationalist in the reporting. The other problem, of course, is you have to get scientists who are willing to talk on camera, talk to the media, and most of us are very camera shy. And if there are no scientists out there to give you the facts, and you don't know who to go to as a journalist, you'll go to anybody who can speak to you. And you don't necessarily know, because not everybody is skilled in every area they report on, whether those facts are correct or whether it's just somebody expressing an opinion. So the, I think we made big mistakes both from the scientific community, but also by allowing much of the sensationalist media to get going and nobody to stand up and say, no, hang on, you're wrong. These are the real facts. Having been and spoken to some of the populations up there who have developed coping strategies, um, we all develop coping strategies for all sorts of things in our lives, so this should be not unusual that we can do this. Most people feel as if they are in control of the risk. So if they can, for example, have a personal dosimeter, measure what they're exposed to, and you provide them with some framework to suggest what that dose fits into, that's one thing. A lot of these people want to grow food on land that's been in their families for years. Um, and I went to one village where they actually have a, 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 um, a containment facility built into the community centre where they can take their own produce, put it into a machine and measure it. And when I asked, have you ever found anything that is over the safe limit and Japanese safe limits for food are lower than they are in most of the rest of the world, including Europe? They said, no, no, nobody's ever registered over the limit. But the pure fact that you could actually go and take your produce there and go put it in the machine and go, yeah, it's fine, it's below the limit, gave people confidence in what they were doing. So it's about ownership of the risk. If you feel that you can do something to own that risk, you learn how to cope with that risk much better. There are scientists and there are scientists. There are scientists who do very good science with right controls in and, and conduct their experiments properly. There are other scientists who, shall we say, are less stringent in, in the way that they conduct their experiments. Um, and I think if you look at the weight of scientific opinion, uh, and that's something I think as a uh, journalist need to do, it's not just express both sides of an argument, but where an argument is heavily weighted to one side, you should be almost reflecting that in the coverage that you give uh, something you're covering as a journalist. So I think we need to, first of all, tackle where we feel we have uncertainties. Um, one of the things we're doing at the UK at the moment is to, is to have a look at all the literature and say, really, what is a good paper? What is a bad paper? What weighting should you put to these arguments? And where are the bits that we still have uncertainty and we can design experiments to reduce those uncertainties? And that's the sort of scientific process that we would do for most other things. And we ought to put that process in place for this. But I, there is an awful lot of rubbish written about radiation and its health effects. And really and truly, proper scientists should be coming out and starting to correct some of those myths because we all need energy. We're all going to need to be involved in an energy debate. We all consume energy and we ought to be taking our part as good citizens and understanding what the, the pros and cons are of various um, energy forms in, in the energy mix that we're going to need going forward. And we shouldn't be using bad science to discount something that could actually lead to a better society.